So hi everyone, good evening. Um, hope you're all well on this beautiful sunny day. Uh, um, and, and welcome to this event. The, this event is uh, a question time event for the Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission. Uh, and we're really looking forward to having a chance to hear your questions and uh, listen and talk with you about uh, our agenda and the key issues and priorities and uh, uh, where we stand on various points. Um, to run through the programme, first of all, I'm Andy Goldson. I am uh, director of the commission uh, and I'm convening tonight's conversation as it were. Uh, and this evening we're going to, in a second, hear a quick uh, update from our chair, Liz Barbara, uh, Barbara, excuse me, about the uh, key functions and activities of the commission. Uh, and then we'll go straight into our question time panel, uh, which has a stellar range of people to join us and answer questions on different aspects of climate change across the region. Uh, we have Rosa Foster, who's co-chair of our Climate Resilience Working Group, uh, and who works for the Environment Agency. Uh, Peter O'Brien, who is a commissioner and is co-chair of the Research and Evidence Panel and uh, chair of Yorkshire Universities. Uh, we have Councillor Richard Cooper, who's one of our vice chairs, uh, and uh, is Vice Chair for North Yorkshire uh, and is um, leader of Harrogate Borough Council. Uh, we have Polly Cook, uh, is a senior officer uh, representing West Yorkshire on the Commission uh, and leads Leeds City Council's work on climate change and sustainability. Uh, and of course, we have Liz Barber, who's our chair uh, and also chief exec of Yorkshire Water. So we're really looking forward to talking to you, but we're just going to take 10 minutes first to uh, give you an update on where we're at with the Commission. Uh, and then we'll come back to discuss various housekeeping points about how to ask questions and participate in the debate. But just quickly in advance, if you have questions as, as you're thinking of them, uh, please do post them in the Q&A box at any time from now. Uh, any pre-submitted questions will be copied into that box. Uh, and um, there'll be a chance for you to vote and upvote for your favorite questions. And we'll try and take them in order of preference and priority. Uh, and uh, please um, uh, mute yourself normally, but unmute yourself um, when, when it comes time to uh, speak and read your questions out. Uh, just to say, um, we are recording this event. I hope that's okay with you. Uh, if not, then, then please leave the meeting. Uh, and this will be shared on our website afterwards. Uh, if you have any technical issues along the way, please use the chat function. Uh, and we're live on, on social media uh, at yhclimate.com and the hashtag is Yorkshire Climate. So hopefully that's all okay. We'll come back to this at the end, but uh, Liz, can we hand over to you to give an oversight overview of the commission? Yes, indeed. And thank you, Andy, for the introduction. And thank you to you all for joining us this evening. It's a beautiful evening and really appreciate your time and interest in what we're doing. So as Andy says, I'm just gonna give you a, a brief update, a reminder about the commission and how it's working. And we had a meeting today, maybe we will give you a little bit of a flavor of what we touched on on today's meeting. So as a reminder, we are an independent advisory group. We're not a regulator. We're not setting targets. We have no powers as such. Uh, we have been put together by the Yorkshire Leaders Group, so it is non-political, in fact, very much non-political. We're all working together to support ambitious climate actions across our region. Um, and it consists of climate leaders from across public, private and third sectors. That's a really, really important point, which we'll come on to later uh, in this brief presentation. And we are very proud to be the largest regional commission of its kind in the UK. So, um, as I said a moment ago, we are supported by the Leaders Board and the 22 councils across Yorkshire and Humber, but we are supported by a number of companies listed here and organisations, so again, the private public sector, the Environment Agency, uh, private sector, uh, the utilities, uh, the main utilities, and of course, very importantly, in coming into this, the universities, uh, particular support from the University of Leeds, and uh, notably the Trades Union Congress, which will play a pivotal role in some of the challenges that we've been talking about. So a little bit more about the construct of the Commission itself. So I'm in as chair. We have four vice chairs 
who represent the regions of Yorkshire. Uh, we have obviously Andy, uh, who's uh, our expert director, uh, who really channels most of the activity uh, of, of the commission. Uh, and he's supported by uh, a central team. And of course, there are four senior officers who support the vice chairs. And there are 28 commissioners from a very widely diverse sectors, as I say, public, private, voluntary. Uh, and it is very exciting that this is the case because we get a very rich discussion and debate and a very thorough understanding of the issues and consequences of climate change and solving the problems of climate change uh, amongst us all. Very important for a region like Yorkshire. We have uh, still some heavy industry. We have some big carbon emitters in the region. Uh, we have a uh, beautiful countryside. We have challenges around too much water, too little water. We have a rural economy, which is very important, which is, is which will be affected by climate change. And of course, we're a region that has suffered from other transitions, in particular out of the coal and steel industry. And one of the things the Climate Ch Commission is here to do is to make sure that as we transition out of certain sectors and into new sectors, that is done in a very fair and very inclusive way. Uh, and we have a very distinct region here in Yorkshire, uh, and we need to make sure that we cover, we cover all the bases. So with that in mind, we have four key aims. Climate resilience. Now, what this is, is that um, uh, what climate, we've just gone on a little bit. If we could just go back a couple of slides if possible, but if not, don't worry. Um, so climate resilience, that is, how does climate impact our region? How does that, how does that impact us in terms of temperature, sea level, drought, flood, uh, what it's doing to the natural environment in terms of biodiversity, how it's going to affect farming, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we are working through how we will be impacted as a region. And today's meeting, we had uh, a good and detailed discussion about how climate uh, how climate change will affect our region and some of the resilience challenges that we need to tackle moving forward. So that is how climate change will impact Yorkshire and how we work together to manage that and to get society ready for it. Um, net zero is really about what it says on the tin, about working together within the Yorkshire region to make sure that we're in a net zero uh, uh, situation. And we have a, a broad target across Yorkshire of net zero by 2038, which reflects the scientific targets and also it reflects the local uh, area plans. Luckily, they all add up to the right number, so we don't have to worry about that. But what we will focus on is all of those who have who have uh, uh, published their net zero plans is to do two things: hold them accountable to that, uh, and also to make sure that where we can capitalise on working together to share resources, to share learning in the best possible way, that together we get to we get to net zero and the discussion we had today uh, which was supported was that it's not just about local areas it's about the big employers and the big institutions and we've agreed that the largest institutions be they public or private in the region will also add to the local area plans uh, and that we'll track our progress towards net zero in accordance with our own plans just an inclusive transition i've already talked about that uh, I'll say a little bit more about la that later on, but it's all about skills. It's all about funding, financing, making sure we've got the right flow of money across the region and we've definitely got the right skills. Uh, so there's a lot for us all to do to work out what skills will no longer be needed and what skills we need to make sure that nobody is left behind. And of course, we need to think about how communities are also impacted by the issues around climate resilience. And then last but not least is nature and biodiversity. We need to make sure that we maintain a thriving region. And if you think about it hard enough, uh, all businesses and all institutions, really, when you strip it all back, 
rely on the natural environment. So looking after that and working with it and protecting that will be absolutely key to our ability to withstand climate resilience, but also to have a thriving economic region. So what I'd like to do is just add a little bit of flavor to some of the things that are happening in Yorkshire now. Um, and uh, climate resilience, we've talked, we've talked about that already. But a couple of pictures here, the, the one at the top is Scale Valley Project, which is helping to protect Fountains Abbey World Heritage Site and protect it from flooding and improving the habitats for a range of wildlife in that area. So natural flooding uh, protection for that you know, very important heritage site. And the picture below is, um, is really referring to the Church Street Flood Alleviation Scheme, which is protecting Whitby from storm surges and flooding and will protect against sea level rise associated with, with climate change. A couple of great examples around net zero. So this is the, the work will be sharing resource uh, and seeing how individuals and in the economy organizations get to net zero as quickly as possible. And a couple of great examples here is Energised Barn Barnsley, which is uh, supporting rooftop solar panels on homes and using a green bond to help communities invest in, in green um, transition. So for example, it's supporting 330 uh, solar panels on, uh, on 330 council houses and also 600 air source heat pumps. So actually it looks as though Barnsley and its council properties are probably well ahead of the housing sector uh, in general. So really exciting stuff. And the picture below is the York trial, uh, 400 e-scooters and 50 e-bikes to trial doing two things to keep emissions and congestion out of uh, York City Centre. And of course, York is investing in clear, a clean air zone and electric buses to, to continue with, uh, with those initiatives. Moving on to just an inclusive transition, uh, very important, make sure nobody and nowhere is left behind and to make sure that we have a fairer and more equal society rather than exacerbating the current inequalities in Yorkshire. So uh, the top example is the Leeds District Heating Scheme, which takes excess heat from the recycling and energy recovery facility in Cross Green and provides heating and hot water to 2000 council flats, which is cheaper than the previous energy provision. And in Rydale in North Yorkshire, uh, there is provision of electric vehicle chargers in long stay car parks so that those people without the ability to charge at home have access to, to chargers so that they, they can switch to electric cars. And last but not least, uh, nature and biodiversity. So the, the top picture is uh, the white rose forest. Uh, very important in terms of not only carbon capture, but flood resilience, improved water quality, uh, in much improved habitat for wildlife, and of course, creating jobs and recreational space for the people of Yorkshire. And the bottom picture, that's a beaver. Uh, which is the Slow the Flow initiative in Crompton Forest, uh, which is a reintroduction of beavers. And those of you who know about these things will understand that we often build what's known as leaky dams to protect peatland and to manage uh, surplus water and keep it in the land where it needs to be. And of course, beavers are uh, uh, builders of natural leaky dams. And of course, that in itself creates a much more uh, biodiverse um, habitat. So lots going on, lots going on. So onto the, onto the panels themselves, so how the commission is structured. So we talked about having lots of commissioners, but there are two key areas of focus at the moment, which is climate resilience and net zero, because what we're working to is Yorkshire's climate action plan ready for COP26. And supporting that, what we call the cross-cutting themes, are about communities engagement, future economy, land and nature, and research and evidence. And the future economy is really focusing on inclusive employment and skills. And we'll also look at how we finance that. And of course, very exciting to have um, a couple of things here. The National Infrastructure Bank based in Leeds, and we're making uh, rapid 
connections with them at the moment to help finance this across Yorkshire. And also, you know, this is led and chaired by the CBI and the TUC, which I just think is a, is a fantastic uh, meeting of minds on something that's so important um, for, our, for our economy. Communities engagement is really about how we involve communities in understanding the issues around climate change, how it will impact them. And in many cases, communities can support each other in resilience against climate change and actually participating in the solutions. So it's really, uh, again, very important piece of work. Land and nature, uh, we've talked about uh, biodiversity, but actually this is also bringing together the landowners to make sure that the way we manage land, the way we farm land, the way we uh, exercise our duties around maintaining land uh, in the best possible way contributes towards both the economy, the farming economy and nature itself. And of course, this all needs to be underpinned very importantly by reliable data. So this is supported by the Yorkshire universities that make sure that when we are pulling this work together, that it is based on robust evidence and the best available research to make sure that where we are taking action, we're taking action uh, in the right way using the right data. And of course, the beauty of these things is that they many of these things will overlap. So much of climate resilience will depend on communities, will depend on land, will depend on um, future economy, they all overlap. And it's partly the work of the Commission, not only to further uh, these pieces of work, but also to make sure that the overlaps are well understood so that we can be um, do this in the best, fastest, most efficient and effective way for, for the region. So that brings me to a close. So we're going to hand over to Andy now just to take us through uh, the plans, the upcoming plans. Thank you, Liz. Um... So the first piece of work that we were tasked with preparing uh, was a climate action plan for the region. Uh, and we know, of course, that there's a lo lot of really positive work happening already, especially amongst our local authorities and our combined authorities and so on. Uh, but there's certainly opportunities for, for them to learn from each other and to transfer best practice and to build capacities and pool resources for delivery. Um, but also that we need to share this across our business communities and across the communities at large, uh, because everybody needs to be involved in this and we need to draw on everyone's commitment and energy and resources to deliver on what is undoubtedly a massive, massive challenge. Uh, so the, the Commission will be preparing a regional climate action plan and in early September there will be uh, two weeks of engagement events uh, to be announced shortly, uh, where we're really keen to have your input uh, and suggestions from different stakeholders on what the key priorities should be. The, the focus of the action plan will be on delivery. Uh, as Liz said earlier, I don't think we need to talk much more about the targets. It's important now that we get on and, and deliver it. And there are a whole load of nitty gritty issues around you know, finance and investment or community engagement and buy-in uh, and business engagement too that we need to, uh, to, 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 to promote and, and support and engage with. So, uh, that's our big priority. And then that will be launched uh, in early November to coincide with COP26 in Glasgow. So that's the priority. And tonight, we'd really love to hear your views and thoughts uh, on priorities for that action plan. Uh, and, you know, this, this engagement event is all to do with us listening and hearing what your priorities should be uh, as well. So we'll come back to that later, no doubt. Um, I need to just break out of the screen and go back to the beginning, excuse me. Um, but uh, yeah, as we were saying earlier on, um, uh, please do post your questions uh, in the uh, chat or the Q&A facility, uh, and we will start to uh, discuss those as we can. So I'm trying to multitask at the same time. Um, this is where my tech skills fall down flat on their face right at the wrong moment. Uh, right, let's go, here we are. Sorry, this isn't very slick, is it? Let's get back to this. Here we are, great. So yeah, please post your uh, questions in the Q&A box. Uh, there were some pre-submitted questions which were which are in there. Uh, open the Q&A box, have a look through the questions and vote for the ones that you would like to see answered and we'll, we'll take them in order. Uh, when it comes to your question, uh, I'll ask you to unmute and speak and read your question out directly and then we will pass it out amongst the panel. So 
uh, let's make a start. Um, I will stop sharing schemes and um, go to the top question. Sorry, we'll, we'll structure this a bit better in a moment. Uh, what does net zero really mean for Yorkshire and Humber? Uh, and when push comes to shove, what has to give to meet the targets? What do we have to do to deliver on ambitious climate targets? Uh, could we start perhaps with Polly on that question? Yeah, absolutely fine, Andy. Um, so when we talk about net zero, we're looking at kind of three key areas, um, housing probably accounting for a third. Um, and what we're seeing is the challenge of actually getting a house genuinely to net zero is really difficult. We need to look at fabric first, so potentially external wall insulation, it could be cavity wall depending on your housing type. Um, looking at then your heating supply, so at the moment most homes in Yorkshire will be supplied by gas. So looking to move those across to potentially an air source heat pump, potentially to a district heat network or to um, hydrogen if that were to come about. So, and then ultimately looking at how the electricity that's used in your house um, is net zero. So either that's actually you putting solar panels individually on your house or ultimately the grid becoming decarbonised. And that, that is in very, very simple terms, making it sound much easier than it is in reality, how we get our housing stock to net zero. Um, and then you obviously from a transport point of view, you're looking to make our transport system more efficient and um, getting more people using communal transport, public transport or active transport. And then for those that are left, that you're looking for cars that are left, obviously looking to get those to electric and also um, the actual kind of HGVs and things looking for alternative fueling infrastructure. And then we need to go through that similar pathway with industry. So there's a lot to be done, I think it's fair to say. So does, does that answer the question sufficiently, Andy, for now? It does. <laughs> Perhaps to relate back to uh, another question, how will we be consulting and how can people input into this? Uh, there, there will be, uh, well, there is a, a climate resilience working group that Rosa has been leading, uh, which is up and running already. Uh, and there will be a net zero working group. Uh, and then once these working groups have, have, have come up with an early draft, there'll be two weeks of consultation in September when we'll be inviting comments and inputs and suggestions on what the priority action should be. Uh, so hopefully that, that there'll be lots of opportunities for for input and uh, you know it'll be a co-produced plan that that, um, that everybody can see the, the relevance and, and contribution of. Um, so uh, there then is a question from Nick, Nick Hodgkinson. Would it be better if I read out the question? I'm not sure, Nick. Hello. Yeah, sorry, I didn't realise I could unmute myself. Um, yeah, so you're very welcome. Hello. Um, and until very recently, um, international aviation emissions were excluded from the UK's carbon budget, and therefore, I would imagine, excluded from the regional carbon budget. But if I understand it rightly, just last month, the government has accepted that those emissions should be included within the carbon budget and therefore has an impact on our, um, <clears throat> our targets to reduce to net zero by 2038 in the region. So I'm asking out of ignorance here, does the current um, regional carbon budget include aviation emissions? And if it doesn't, will it, will it be revised to include them? Perhaps before I come to Polly again, sorry, I should have uh, uh, planned this so we pass the questions around more broadly. Uh, I can say that there is a regional carbon target now uh, adopted by the Yorkshire Leaders Board, uh, which says that we should we work towards net zero by 2038 and demonstrate rapid progress or significant progress towards that by 2030. It actually doesn't specify the scope of what's included in that at the moment. But as a commission, we are looking now, and there's work underway, to look at consumption-based emissions, which would include flying and aviation. Uh, and we will be considering those uh, in our, in, within the scope of our activities. Um, but there is a, a, a slightly fuzzy point still about whether they're in scope of the regional target or not. 
uh, as you say, the government has recommended that they should be brought into the scope of the six carbon budget, but the, uh, there is still no national aviation strategy uh, to uh, deliver on that and to show how aviation will be made consistent. And you know, that, that lack of a national strategy really does impact on us at a local level. But um, Polly, could we ask you to talk about this a little as well? Yep, no problem, Andy. Um, so I think the, uh, my answer was very similar to Andy in the sense that as a council, specifically as Leeds Council, we have been asking for a national strategy on aviation um, for a couple of years because it's very difficult to, to plan something like that at a local position. The airport, for example, Leeds Bradford doesn't serve just Leeds residents. Um, and therefore that decision making happening at that level doesn't make sense. Um, so we really welcome the fact that it's been incorporated into the, AV, into the carbon budget. We think that's absolutely the right decision. And we really welcome the fact that, well, we anticipate that there's gonna be much clearer national direction on that, um, which I think will put us in a much better position as a country, not just as a region. So I think that probably mirrors what Andy said, to be honest, but I share his views on that. Thank you. Nick, do you want to come back at all? Well, only to say it is a good thing that it's been included in the UK carbon budget, but um, I wouldn't hold your breath, um, I'm afraid, in my opinion, for particularly swift government recommendations on how it should be dealt with at a national level. So all I would say is that my sense of urgency, which I'm sure you share, is that we shouldn't wait to be led completely by national government. We should be making our own policies and taking our own initiatives uh, within our own hands locally. I can say as far as, far as the Commission goes that there will be a consumption-based section of the action plan and that will consider the significance of all forms of consumption including aviation. So to that extent absolutely we are dealing with it, we're not, not brushing it to one side or ignoring it by any means. Um, can we move on to the next question, uh, which is from Stuart Boothman. Um, Stuart, you've actually posted two questions, but can we, uh, can we ask you to uh, post your question about the, the, the greenwash and net zero first, if that's all right. Stuart. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of um, criticism by environmentalists about net zero and it being used as a, a sort of greenwash cover for business as usual by by some sectors more than others, um, but certainly with some apparent support from government. So the question is, is it more about our confidence as the general public? How can we be sure that the Commission as a whole are pushing genuine decarbonisation for our region? Uh, Liz, can we go to you first and then to Rosa, if that's okay? So uh, thank you for the question. I, I think um, the first part to answer that is to make sure that we've got experts who know what they're doing um, on the commission to really make sure that we talked a little bit before about the, the, you know, the, the data and the robustness of that. So I'm sure Peter will come in in a moment, but that's why we've got experts here in a specific panel to make sure that there's no ducking the realities of, of the challenges. Um, and uh, when we're looking at local area uh, as uh, uh, net zero plans, as Andy says, we're going to have a realistic view of the consumption uh, uh, related uh, uh, issues across the region. And we will uh, invite the 50 largest institutions to put forward their plans. Uh, and we will review those for credibility. Does it do, does it stack up? You know, are those plans looking robust? And of course, what we will be doing is looking at how they are progressing against those plans. But I think key to this is when we put together our climate action plan is that we've got good, robust data that really sets out the size of the challenge in the region. And then those plans that are being put together uh, our robust plans and we're tracking against them and that is all within the remit of the Commission. Thanks Liz. Uh, Rosa, do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, just, just to say really um, that I think net zero 
yeah, I understand the way you're coming from in the point, Stuart, in, in terms of greenwashing and the, the carbon absorption side of the net zero balancing. I think um, what what I would say to that is I think there is a, there is an awful lot of work going on um, with the central government uh, between the Environment Agency and DEFRA, but not only a number of interested parties, several of whom are also commission members, actually, in this commission. Um, we're working together to look at a range of codes to make sure or kite marks to make sure that people who do genuinely you know work to reduce their carbon are then also in a very robust um and with a high integrity way are, are being able to absorb their carbon and talk talk about that confidently i think there's a lot of hesitation about people doing um that that balancing piece but of course that balancing piece has a lot of um additional benefits too so a lot of you know that is nature-based solutions to the climate emergency in 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 other language um and and that derives water quality benefits it reduces wildfire risk it, it um it provides flood risk benefits um urban heat cooling uh effects um and there, there's a lot in there around like how we use our land what does that mean for a sustainable climate ready yorkshire um, but those are the things, those are the challenges that I think the Commission is definitely starting to get its head around. Um, and what role does the Commission play versus the, the combined authorities and the, you know, with the mayors or, or the LEPs and the, lo at the local authority and more. Um, and then below that again at the more community based uh, level. So trying to work out how, how the Commission augments that work. Um, and really adds value, but um, fundamentally it comes down to working out what the actions are and then tracking them, as Liz has said. Uh, Richard, Peter, do you want to add anything on that? If uh, Andy, I could say just something briefly about the research and evidence panel, which uh, Liz alluded to, and I think it tries to provide um, a bit more uh, further detail or response to the, the question. So the, the research and evidence panel is um, consisting of um, academics across Yorkshire and the Humber, from our universities uh, and beyond. It's there to develop and feed insights and evidence into the Commission across the Commission's brief around mitigation, adaptation, just transition, nature and biodiversity. And I think as people will recognise, and you will, Andy, as an academic, concept of academic uh, autonomy being very important in order to provide that critical friend challenge to what's emerging out of the Commission's activities and outputs, and in particular, in the run-up to the development of the Climate Action Plan, which we hope to launch, and we intend to launch, I should say, um, uh, at COP26. And so work around developing and applying metrics and indicators that can be used to monitor and track climate action across the region is a central part of the terms of reference for that research and evidence panel. So I think, as Liz said, um, having robust evidence, having that independent constructive challenge from experts in the region, I think is important for the Commission going forward. Thanks, Peter. Um, we then have a question, I'm not quite sure who it's from. It's uh, posted in the text. Uh, forgive me if I'm overlooking who, who, who asked this question, but uh, perhaps to Richard. Um, public sector procurement has a significant role to play in decarbonisation. And the government has recently said that suppliers will need to uh, reach uh, and have net zero commitments. Uh, what do we need to do to ensure the company's net zero ambitions are, are linked to real emissions reductions and what's the role of public procurement in promoting change? Well, thanks so much, Andy, and thank you for whoever posted that question. Um, I think public procurement does have a role to play here uh, in that we can put stipulations on which companies uh, get contracts with um, public bodies like councils, but other public authorities as well. We can already put stipulations on regarding the supply chain, i.e. how local a company has to be in order to be part of the bidding. Uh, and indeed, many councils stipulate that at least a third of the companies or who bid for a contract are locally based. So um, that already mitigates things like travel, long supply chains, etc. cetera. Um, we should look at if we can incorporate uh, the uh, emissions record, the net zero ambitions of companies in uh, local procurement, uh, I think that would be a positive way forward. What we have to do as well, though, is make sure that um, when we do do that, that we publicise the fact that this is part of the decision. So people can make judgments themselves 
on the companies that get public contracts and whether they are um, ambitious enough in terms of net zero and carbon reduction. Uh, because ultimately, the money being spent by councils on procurement is public money. And public pressure can change how councils procure services. Uh, and if part of that, uh, that process is an assessment of the net zero ambitions, the carbon reduction ambitions of a company, then I think that is uh, a good message we can send to the public about how serious we are about this. And that goes back to the greenwashing uh, question that was um, uh, previous to this one. Also, I think uh, if we were able to develop some sort of kite mark, as uh, I think Rosa mentioned earlier, for businesses um, about their green credentials, their environmental credentials, about their ambitions for net zero, that not just local authorities, but everybody can look at, can examine and say, that's a company I want to use. That's a company I want to go to. That's someone who I want to buy things from because I can see easily at a glance that they are compliant with the net zero ambitions of this climate commission, not the people across Yorkshire uh, and the Humber. So I think uh, public procurement does have a role to play. It's much wider than that. Uh, and I think we need to give people confidence that councils, other public bodies are procuring services with the environment in the forefront of their minds. I, I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Liz, could we uh, ask you to switch hats quickly and just talk about Yorkshire Water and what you do to promote um, sustainability through your supply chains? Mm. Well, we um, we view ourselves as what we call an anchor institution. So we have a big impact on employment um, uh, and, in fact, carbon emissions in the region up to 2%. Uh, so we have our own carbon target net, net zero uh, by 2030, and we can't do that without making sure that the supply chain is absolutely lined up to that. So at the moment, in the next five years, we'll be halving our capital emissions by 50 percent, and that's all getting tied in or is tied in with the contracts we've let over the next five years. So it will be kind of a contractual requirement for our framework partners to demonstrate that they are uh, alongside us meeting those targets. Thank you, Liz. Um, we now have two questions which um, I'm going to bring together. Uh, they're both about specific developments. Um, the first is from Claire Baker, uh, and there's a second which is unnamed about a development in Ferriby near Hull. Um, I'm not sure we can answer the exact specifics of each individual case, but I think the broader points we can definitely discuss. So. Um, uh, Claire, would you like to come online and, and, and make your question? Thank you. Hi, um, yeah, thank you for letting me speak. I'm just losing my voice, sorry. <coughs> um, I actually sub pre-submitted a question, so I'll, I'll ask the one that I put in the chat box. Um, so I'm chair of Althor Fields Action Group, um, a group in South East Sheffield. Um, it's a 20 acre site, it's a huge carbon sink, and it's gonna be destroyed in a couple of months um, for housing. Um, it was farmland and it's been rewilding now. It hasn't been touched for 22 years. It's, um, it has hundreds and hundreds of trees. It's covered in scrub and grassland habitat. Um, it has a huge amount of biodiversity, um, priority species, habitats, uh, red listed species, badgers, bats. I mean, I, the list is endless. Um, and yet the developer can pay £234,000 and, and offset all this. Um, so my question really is, how can cutting down hundreds of 20 year old trees ever be justified, one in a climate emergency? Um, obviously, I support planting new trees, but um, really, to we need to just stop what you stop destroying what we have. You know, there needs to be changes to planning rules to protect what we have, because at the moment it's too easy for developers who have money. So um, my, my question is, what are your views on this? And will you be actively supporting changes to planning policy? And will you be supporting groups like ours fighting to save these kind of spaces? Because obviously they're, they're huge carbon sinks and when it's destroyed, it's gonna release a huge amount of carbon. So thank you. Thank you, Claire. And um, there's another similar question uh, from Georgina, uh, this time about the East of Otley development. Uh, Georgina, would you come online and make that question too?
Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine, go ahead. Yeah, the community and the residents um, of Otley in the wider area are really concerned about this planning application that does not take into consideration sort of, uh, the climate crisis, the commitments made, and nature and wildlife diversity. And it's live at the moment. And I just want to know what the council's really, uh, the view is on, on developments which are happening now, that we can do something, we can take into consideration all these key aims and reject these planning permissions that just go totally against it. So, you know, we want your support. I mean, the community is wanting to do things for climate and yet, why we don't want to be working against councils we want to work with you so how what's your how, how, how can you help and support this thanks georgina uh, there's also another question which is similar in some ways about a greenfield development in north Ferriby for an amazon fulfillment center uh, raises the same kind of concerns i think about planning policy um richard can we come to you first on this and, and then perhaps to polly is the the two local authority people perhaps with you know, insights around planning and planning reform and, uh, you know, what could be done better in that space. Richard. Thanks very much, Andy, and thank you for the various points about applications. What I don't want to do is to get into the specifics about each application, uh, because if you do that, you may find yourselves on the, the wrong side of uh, an inspector's ruling in a planning inquiry for predetermination. And I'm sure people are aware of those boring and jargonistic uh, legal uh, requirements. So. Um, please bear that in mind in the answer to give. When a development comes forward for the local authority, it needs to be compliant with the uh, local authority's local plan. In that case, in Harrogate, we have a local plan which provides protection for um, land that isn't in it for development, either for employment or for housing. Some authorities don't have a local plan, and that means they have uh, lesser protection for land than they might otherwise uh, have. So speculative developments, opportunistic developments by um, developers uh, may come forward, which are less easy to protect at a planning appeal or a planning inquiry. So the first thing is the development has to be compliant with the local plan. And it's not just that the area is allocated in the local plan for development, there are various policies within local plans to which that must be compliant. And one shouldn't think that just because a planning application comes in, that it's automatically going to be passed. Um, uh, it has to go through the, the relevant processes and it has to go through public consultation. Councils legally have to process applications that are submitted to them. So uh, there is the opportunity for public involvement. There is an opportunity uh, through the local plan process to have a um, structured and um, firm defense against planning applications. Um, it also has to be compliant with an adopted, and I saw in the Otley question, uh, an adopted um, area plan, a smaller plan, usually put forward by the community, um, but that community plan also has to be compliant with the local plan. So um, I think what I'm saying is, if something's going to local plan that you don't like, protest at that stage, um, put forward good reasons why it shouldn't, um, get good planning reasons as to why things shouldn't go forward. But if something's compliant with the local plan, then uh, the likelihood is, that it will at some stage, either at planning committee or at uh, a planning inquiry, um, be approved. So getting in early with good reasons why somewhere shouldn't be developed is key. Thanks Richard. I, I suppose that raises the question about engaging with the local plan process rather than waiting for specific planning applications. But, but Polly, would you comment? I just need to make the point that the one that's mentioned in Leeds is a live planning application. So I'm, I, as Councillor Cooper's pointed out, I can't comment on that. Um, but in general terms, I just say um, there is also the national context. Um, so it's good, you know, in terms of the lobbying that happens at local level, getting involved in the process. And Andy is absolutely right that actually, for example, at the moment in Leeds, we're going through a refresh of the local plan, making sure the climate emergency is at the heart of it. So we absolutely will welcome kind of public involvement in that to try and make it as robust as we can and, you know, and people supporting what we're putting in um, and making sure that the climate emergency voice is really strong in that. Um, however, 
we do have national national policies that limit us so i mean if we take site allocation you know we have a target for the amount of houses that have to be built we have to have a site allocation plan and um, if we didn't have that and if we didn't have the local plan we are actually at more at risk of random developments um, so I think as well as that kind of specific lobbying, there is also having to look at what's limited at a national level and putting pressure on at that level as well as locally. So I'll leave it there because I think Councillor Cooper covered it fairly thoroughly. I think too, it's probably important to say that the commission, we had our second meeting this afternoon, we're still just getting up and running. One of the things we're doing is establishing a land and nature panel uh, with a view to looking at land use decision-making It'll take us a little while, but I, uh, one of our other roles is to, to say more clearly what we need uh, to Westminster to enable us to respond to both the climate and the nature and biodiversity crises. Uh, and I, I would hope that in time the Commission will uh, you know, have something to say on the local planning process and, and the planning reforms and some of the key elements of it, you know, such as uh, biodiversity net gain, which um, are pretty contentious. Uh, where, you know, with time, the Commission will come to a view uh, and, um, uh, you know, make a case for change if we think that that's appropriate. Um, there's a related question here, I suppose, in some ways, which is from Luke Steele. Uh, Luke, this is around um, the announcement from the Committee on Climate Change today uh, has a specific focus on uh, peat bogs. Uh, Rosa and, and Peter, perhaps, can I prime you that this could come to you? Um, uh, Rosa from, from the Environment Agency perspective, but Peter, I know that there's so much work being done on na nature-based solutions and so on across uh, the region's universities that might be relevant here. But uh, Luke, can you make your question? Thank you. Hi, um, just to introduce myself, I'm Luke Still, I'm a PhD researcher in Upland Reform at the University of Bradford. Um, and I just wanted to ask the panel that given the Climate Change Commissions today, recommended that all of the UK and therefore Yorkshire's upland peak bogs must be restored to lock vast amounts of carbon into the ground. Does the Yorkshire Climate Change Commission intend to work with DEFRA to address the intensive land uses which are depleting the peatlands? Rosa, can we come to the you first? So I didn't quite, um, you cut, I'm sorry about the signal for me, Luke, you cut out mid, midway. Would you mind repeating, repeating the end of the question for me, Luke, please? Yeah, it was to say that given the Climate Change Commission has today recommended that all of the UK's upland peat bogs must be restored to lock vast amounts of carbon into the ground, does the Yorkshire Climate Change Commission intend to work with DEFRA to address the int intensive land uses which deplete them? So I, I would say the very short answer to that is yes. <laughs> um, so I think um, I think we, we've got really some really interesting conversations starting. So again, I just reiterate what Andy was saying in terms of it was the second full meeting today. We've had a, um, a, a, a number of discussions in the climate resilience working group where we started to look at um, the challenges and opportunities of changes in land use in Yorkshire and Humber and what that means. Um, and, and through that, you know, we've had, we've had membership from the NFU um, in those discussions, as well as um, at the key sort of environmental uh, groups. And I think what, what's becoming really clear through that is that the sustainable landscape that we need in the future is going to require changes, but we need to do that quite um, sensitively recognizing that the farming industry at the moment is under like those businesses are under a lot of pressure and a high degree of uncertainty with various policy like large policy changes affecting them um but there is a lot of opportunity in in that in that change um or in those changes that we would want to see realized um but equally yeah they are like landowners and farmers are the stewards of of our land um, and so we need to need to work with them to, to towards those sustainable futures. We've got some great case studies um, of, of really powerful work that we've been doing for a long time um, with the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust in particular, but a large number of partners. We've got the Peatland Part uh, the Peatland Partnership, um, 
which uh, looks at upland peat. We've got uh, the Humber Head Levels Partnership, which is led by the Orchard Wildlife Trust um, around the, the lowland peat. And I think lowland peat is going to become a, an increasingly important sequestration habitat. Um, but again, poses a lot, a lot of land use um, questions and challenges to us. And Andy mentioned there'll be a land, food and agriculture, uh, land, food and nature, sorry, um, uh, panel. And that that will, it will deliberately, the, the way that that has been conceived is deliberately to bring that conversation to the fore uh, and really start to tackle it. So not, not an immediate answer, but um, yeah, ho hopefully an indicator that we're really thinking about it. That's great, thank you. Peter, have you got anything to add on, on that? Um, I think just, well, first of all, um, Luke, good to, good to hear from you. Thanks for the question and best of luck with a PhD study at, at Bradford and uh, be really keen to um, see how perhaps you could um, engage uh, through your institution with, with the research and evidence panel. It's really important uh, that we get uh, early career researchers kind of engaged in, and students engaged in our activity. Um, I guess just thinking about the Climate Change Committee's report that was published um, today, um, I think what was quite noticeable from it was um, the fact that they were indicating or making a very clear sort of statement um, that the UK has the capacity and resources to respond to, to risks, but has not yet done so. Um, and I guess in many ways, um, you know, what they're saying is that acting, acting now um, will be far cheaper than waiting for the consequences and I guess through those kind of nature-based sort of solutions um, it seems to be that you know the some of the solutions are in our hands at the moment um, and so not pressing ahead with them seems to me to be um, actually creating a much more serious problem and issue that we're going to have to deal with and we're going to have to spend more money on trying to address so um, I think it just makes kind of perfect sense really to kind of um, plow ahead with um, some of these kind of recommendations there. But um, as Rosa said, I think the commission itself will be exploring these through the various panels that we're setting up, particularly the land and nature panel. That's great. Thanks, Peter. It's appreciated. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Anthony, who's asking a question about uh, houses and uh, new build standards. Uh, Anthony. you might be on mute. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. The, the, the question was just um, that I'm aware there are lots of um, housing developments still going on. Um, and the, the, you know, we, we are putting in uh, infrastructure there. So we're putting in gas boilers that are going to have to be changed. We know that it's far easier to build uh, new build uh, and put a heat pump in at that stage than to retrofit the house later on. It's, it's really, really costly to do retrofitting. We're also not doing what seem like really quite cheap things like putting in electric car charging points on houses that have drives. Um, it, I, as far as I understand it, the national policy on that's not going to change for another four years. Is there anything we can do locally? Can councils through planning and through uh, local authority housing, is there anything we can do to, to make what seem like relatively simple and common sense uh, development here? Richard, is that one we can channel to you? Yeah, I think so. There are things that local authorities can do, um, particularly where they actually own housing stock, which I think is most local authorities. Uh, and if, if I can give you some four instances, um, but first, I'll just take the general point that it is more difficult to retrofit than, I suppose, get it right the first time. So I think the point you have made is a good point and it is uh, well made. But where you actually own the stock, you can do things such as in Harrogate, we've um, fitted 530 of our properties with external wall insulation to solid wall properties. Uh, we have the best rated condensing boilers in all our stock. We were the first authority in the country, I believe, to fit ground source heat pumps to council houses. And again, this is retrofitting, so it's more difficult than just doing it uh, right when you actually build the properties. Of course, these aren't new properties. We fitted solar PVs to um, a large number of houses in the housing stock. I mean, you can't do that for all of them, of course, because 
it's got to be an orientation thing with the sun, etc. So you can do things where you control the, where, where you control the stop. Uh, Polly's point earlier about um, national guidelines is is relevant as well because developers aren't going to um, voluntarily build in excess of national guidelines. They they're going to build to the cheapest build they can do. And I think uh, I thought the rules had already changed electric charging points, but I could well be wrong on that. So um, I'll take so that I'll have a look at that. But what councils can also do is um, develop. Uh, documents of their own to attach their local plans, a development plan document, it's called DPD. Um, Harrogate is currently developing one of those to increase the sustainable standards uh, that we expect of developers. Um, and I think that uh, is something that other authorities should look at doing as well if they haven't done so already. But finally, what I, I also do is I try and get, where there's a large development in the area I represent, I try and get the developers together with local residents to talk about how we can do things such as getting flow through the cycle routes and cycle routes are keen to our cycle network, um, uh, how we can put green uh, barriers in between uh, residents who are already there and the new residents and new developments. So I think there are a large number of things that can be done through national legislation, local legislation, councils doing things to their own housing stock, uh, and also through just general discussion between developers and nearby residents who are affected. Because every developer wants residents supporting their development, or at least not opposing it, um, and um, they will usually be amenable to quite some changes to a site uh, in discussion with residents who live nearby. So there's uh, a few points there, and I'm sure there are many, many more. Thanks, Richard. Um, Polly, Leeds City Council has made a massive commitment recently to retrofitting uh, parts of its housing stock, uh, the council housing stock in particular. Can you, can you address any aspects of this point as well? So within planning policy within Leeds, we already have charging points as a, a compulsory item. So for residential, like you say, with drives, they have to be fitted. And for car parking, there's a ratio. Um, I think it's one to ten, but I may have got my numbers wrong in terms of spaces that have to have charge points. Um, so that, that does already exist in Leeds. So it is feasible under the planning system. Um, we are looking at all our housing. So we've made a commitment of 100 million of our money will be invested in retrofitting our housing stock. Um, we're doing a lot of work around our tower blocks, um, a lot of which were either um, heated through a central sort of gas boiler system or through electric and looking at ground source heat pumps, which we've fitted and then all the individual blocks, individual flats have their own controllable system. Um, so there's a lot of work going on and I think the important thing in terms of the, the kind of what the public sector does, it shows that it can be done, it's achievable, it's feasible and it, it helps to de-risk it for some of the private developers. So I think that's quite important that we do take um, those kind of bigger steps and take a few more risks in terms of what we do. Great, thank you Polly. Um, Next up, can we ask Pedro to ask you a question? And Liz, perhaps this is one I can channel to you. Uh, it's around what the Commission can do on climate change and health. Uh, there's a message from Pedro. Pedro, I'm happy to ask you a question if you'd rather. Okay, actually, you're unmuted now. Simon's just told you if you want to go ahead. Oh, hi, sorry. <laughs> um, right. Yeah, um, so, so my question really was about the place of human health in the Climate Commission, because human health, public health and the environment go, go hand by hand, really. And climate change, as you all know, is predicted to have massive consequences in terms of public health, also in Yorkshire. So I was wondering, as I say, what, what's the place in, of, of public health here? Because I, I haven't seen uh, much about public health in, you know, in the information that is available about the Commission. Thank you. OK, thank you for your question, Pedro. It, it is picked up in the impact on communities through the climate change resilience work. Clearly, the impact on public health is, as you say, you know, uh, actually, could be very significant to the negative, but if done well with the provision of better open spaces, cleaner air, et cetera, actually could have a positive impact on, on public health if done in the right way. So it sits in the main 
in the climate resilience uh, piece of work, which is, of course, led by partly uh, co-chaired by Rosa, but it will also, and this is the area of the commission that's yet to get up and running, certainly in the communities and engagement with communities work, and there may well be an overlap between the two. But I wonder, Rose, if you want to sort of pick up the aspects on public health that you've got to so far with the climate resilience work. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a really great question, Pedro. I think it's something that's um, easily overlooked, but actually um, uh, organisations like the West Yorkshire and Harrogate Healthcare Partnership um, has some really bold statements and ambitions around climate change, um, recognising the impact of that on, on public, as you've outlined, the impact of it on public health. So that would be a good place to look up um, some specifics. They ran some um, really interesting workshops back in October last year, um, a couple of days, uh, I think it was a climate change summit, um, and uh, there were some really good examples there from West Yorkshire as well, um, so Robin Tuckman, the Chief Exec for Calderdale Council, presented about how he, he's, his vision for Calderdale and how they see uh, the challenges uh, that have uh, or how their communities have evolved to the challenges of flood risk in Calderdale and the significant impact on community well-being and, and individual uh, physical and mental well-being um, from continuing to live in what is mainly a beautiful place that has, has this climate shock um, and climate risk impact. Um, and, and how we sort of turn that into a, like a resilient place strategy. Um, so that's really, really interesting work as well. So we're sort of trying to pull on some of those exemplar um, pieces of work and, and weave them into, into our work. Um, I think one of the really other interesting ideas that's come from NHS Digital is, is the story of more, which we've referred to or alluded to a number of times in the answers for today um, around how uh, you can create a sense of a positive future um, that is both net zero or um, absolute zero um, and, uh, and and resilient, um, and that, that that those are good places for people to live. There will there will be social cohesion, and communities will feel stronger, own their place, um, take local action, take positive action themselves. Um, and, and yeah, that atmosphere, that environment physically and uh, I guess uh, socially will, will be enabled. And that, that's really what we've got to focus on and health and well-being is an incredibly important part of that. Thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions in the list about finance and investment. Uh, Catherine, can you, can you put yours first? And then um, just for ease of speed, uh, Nick, you've put a question about pension funds and divestment, which I'll feed in uh, as well, so we can get as many questions in before 7.15 as possible. So, Catherine, go ahead. Um, the uh, UK Commission on Climate Change reported today about the shockingly unpreparedness of the, uh, so the Yorkshire and Humber's to be commended. What do businesses need to persuade them to invest to really reduce carbon emissions? We know that the workforce needs investment in low carbon solutions like energy efficient homes. What else is needed? How can businesses and landlords in Yorkshire and Humber be persuaded to go further than current national regulations to win these gains? Thank you. Catherine. Um, Liz, is that one you, you might be able to start with? I wonder if I could talk about businesses um, and somebody else could maybe talk about uh, landlords. Um, uh, but certainly in terms of um, the business perspective, we all have to understand, and this is again came up as part of the discussion on resilience today, what is the impact on the region and what is the impact on your business because every business every institution every business ultimately relies on the environment and uh, many businesses will face like the rest of us uh, potential water uh, surplus flooding uh, water shortage if they are a very high user um, and uh, 
all the other issues associated with climate change through to workforce readiness. And of course, what can happen if you're a business and you're setting up a new business that needs new skills and you don't have them, that's a really serious issue. So I think businesses are getting it now. Uh, and it's funny you should talk about uh, financing as well, because my experience with my other Yorkshire Water hat on is that many investors uh, require green credential or at least to see that businesses are considering very carefully the impact of climate change on their business before they will lend them the money. Of course, that makes sense. If you're lending money for 20 years and we're facing climate change, if you're a bank, you want to see that this business is going to be around in 20 years and therefore resilient to the challenges of climate change. So quite a lot encouraging is working through the system. People will not invest in your business unless you can begin to demonstrate that you get this, you get the issue of resilience and climate change and prepare to play your part. So, um, so I, I think that's working its way through the system could be quicker. And I'd like to see more businesses and institutions in Yorkshire getting to grips with this. One of the things we'd really like to do, however, is, is, through, the, uh, is through the commission, is it's easy for bigger institutions to actually have the resource to work out where are my unresilient climate change and where do I need to invest in the right way to protect my business and actually get to net zero. And those of us with kind of a lot of you know, decent amount of resource that can focus on these things is okay. Where we've got to offer help, and this is one of the things the commission needs to do, is to reach out to SMEs, is to help them work through the issues to help them calculate what they may do. And of course, with the National Infrastructure Bank now setting up in Leeds is be a conduit for those smaller businesses and other institutions who may want to finance to get hold of finance in order to help them with their net zero, with their net zero plans. Regarding landlords, well, I suppose that's the economics, isn't it? Um, around, uh, it, it's difficult for landlords because they don't, pay the bill they tend not to pay the um, energy bill I think the issue is around incentivizing people who own homes whoever that is to get on board with new ways of heating and I think Rosa talked about that earlier on so we need to incentivize every every homeowner to start to think differently and be ready for the changes that are coming to use much more climate friendly uh, heating thank you and I, I think um there are some great innovations going on in the financing space at the moment and perhaps Nick and Stuart uh, addressing your point about divestment. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be wonderful if there were many more opportunities for local people and local institutions to significantly increase the level of investment in their local community? Uh, and you look at green bonds and Yorkshire Water have issued a huge green bond. I think North Northern Gas Networks are doing the same in, in the near future. Uh, there's been talk about others doing it too. You know, to mobilize the resources we have and to invest in our region uh, and to do that in a way that delivers, you know, effective responses to climate change and good quality jobs and so on. I think that the opportunity to reconnect people and their money to their community and their place is, is really one of the most exciting things. So I would love the Commission to be working in that space and hopefully we will uh, before too long. Um, <clears throat> There's a great question here from Richard, but I'm, Richard, I'm gonna save that to last because it's a good one to wrap up on if you don't mind. Uh, and I'm afraid we're not gonna be able to get through all the questions, but next up, there's a question from Tom around transport, uh, which relates explicitly to Harrogate. Perhaps we can broaden it out to think about uh, transport more broadly. So Tom, are you there and able to ask the question? If you, I think you're on mute. I don't know if you can unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can now, great, go ahead. Hi there, thanks. Yeah, I'm a journalist for the Stray Ferret and often when we report about the different transport schemes that aim to tackle climate change, there's quite polarizing responses from the public. Um, so I'd like to ask, why is this? And what can local politicians do to ensure they bring as many residents with them as possible when these schemes are put forward? Thanks, Tom. Um, Richard, uh, without constraining it only to Harrogate, can we put that question to you? How can we promote sustainable transport and bring people with us in the process? Well, I think this is something I've said many, many times in Harrogate. 
Um, I think this is about being honest with people. And you can't say to people on the one hand um, that we support, support sustainable transport, but then say to them on the other hand, that that means they can carry on using their cars as they've already done. And in fact, increase their car usage because the two things are um, not able to be done at the same time. Sustainable transport means taking away land that is used, tarmac that's used for cars and giving it to buses, giving it to bicycles and giving it to pedestrians. And that is always going to cause a lot of controversy because um, people want to carry on as things are. But if we carry on as things are, we're never going to get to net zero. And everyone says sustainability is great, that we want to reach net zero. Um, and to do that, I'm afraid we have to be honest with people and say there are things that are going to have to change. And the way we all get around, the way we all travel, and this isn't just a Harrogate issue, it's a worldwide problem, um, is going to have to change. Because travel is one of the biggest emitters of greenhouse gases of carbon uh, alongside housing about which we discussed uh, earlier. So I think it's about being honest with people, putting the facts in front of them and saying to them, this is what we have to do. And at the same time as doing that, encouraging them to use the new facilities that are put in place. But whenever you change anything, it's going to be divisive. You explain it honestly, you tell people what needs to be done, you explain why you're doing it, and you will never get everybody agreeing with you. Um, but you've got to be honest with people and say, if we're going to reach net zero, the way we do things now has to change. And if people are committed to reaching net zero, as nearly everyone will tell you that they are, they're committed to sustainability, then they have to realise that things have to change. We can't have no change and expect things to get better. So that's, uh, that's how I broadly answer that question. It's about everyone being honest about the scale of the problem and what needs to be done to address it. Thank you, Richard. Um, we are fast running out of time. Uh, and Richard Berry, uh, you have a great question, which I think would be good to go around all of the people on the panel quickly to say what they would think success for the commission looks like in the next five to 10 years. So Richard, are you, are you there to come online and ask a question? Ah, yes. Can you hear me okay? Yep, go ahead. Yeah, so um, the the overall approach of the Commission is, is excellent, and I like the, the aims of the Commission are outstanding. Um, but what practical outcomes do you see coming out of the Commission? And, and what do you see the short and medium term success factors? I mean, what would you look at, say, in five years time, looking back to see, have we done good or not? It's a great question, Richard. Um, let's go round the panel. Um, Rosa, can we start with you? Yeah, so re really great question, Richard. Um, uh, yeah, I think for me it would be that we've got that we've added values. There are a lot of conversations that are happening, um, but that we've created new collaborations that really um, bring different sectors together and start and have demonstrated how we're now starting to do things differently, how we're making decisions differently. Um, and that, that could be at a range of different scale. So I, I appreciate that probably sounds a bit nebulous as a, as a smart target, um, but definitely that, that would be the main thing for me that we're working together, being able to really demonstrate that we're working together differently um, uh, and, and really tackling some of these issues that we've talked about today. <laughs> Thanks, Rosa. Uh, Peter, can we can we put the question to you? Yes, thanks. Um, I guess in the sh in the short term, it would be um, the production and starting to implement a very comprehensive but effective action plan. Um, I think uh, we also want to see wider citizen public engagement, and then going forward in the longer term, you would hope that there is no need for a commission for this side. That actually, what the commission is advocating is is within. Um, both our local and regional institutions and what communities and businesses will be doing as a matter of course. So um, almost without putting ourselves out of a job, Andy, I think that would be the ultimate aim, wouldn't it? It's a great answer, Peter. You got the job for now. Um, Polly, next up. OK, so, I mean, clearly the, the kind of action plan and then drilling down sort of under that um, some really viable finance products. Um, that actually allow things like the housing retrofit to happen and make it practical to deliver. 
and also um, a good practical evaluation of sort of jobs and skills gaps and looking at how we can top up people's skills um, to improve their ability to respond to the new growing sort of green jobs available. So I think they're some of the, the barriers to delivery at the moment. So looking to address those two. Um, and I have to agree, I think the engagement all the way will always win for me. Um, but on net zero and resilience um, will be the, the sort of three key things I'd like. Thank you, Polly. Uh, Richard. Thanks. Uh, mine are a bit more philosophical um, uh, reflections on, on what we were doing. Um, in the short term, I think what we have to do is to make everybody realise that it's not someone else's problem. It's all our problems. It's business, it's local government, it's national government, um, uh, and it's individuals as well. So we stop people thinking that somebody else is going to deal with this problem. We'll leave it to a local council, we'll leave it to a government or something like that. It's all our problems. In the longer term, what I'd like to um, see is that we've persuaded people uh, of what they need to do by being honest with them about the scale of the problem uh, and about what needs to happen to us, our lives personally, as well as the lives of people in our communities um, in order to reach net zero. So people have a clear idea about what is required. And I think that goes back to what Polly said about engagement, uh, which I think is critically important. Thank you, Richard. Uh, and last up, Liz. The problem with coming last is that everybody gives great answers and you kind of run out of them. So I'm going to say something uh, uh, for the region. I would, uh, I think this is a massive opportunity for us to throw away, are we public sector, private sector, voluntary sector, uh, whatever our politics are. And this is for us as a region to convene in a way nowhere else does to tackle the huge challenges that we share. And I'd like our region to be recognised to lead, to be leading the way, certainly in the UK and possibly beyond. Thank you, Liz. I think that that's the key point. We need to make a real difference. And I, just looking at Catherine's comment in the, in the text, I would completely agree that the, the Commission needs to, you know, help Yorkshire to be a leader and to, to make a tangible difference. So, um, thank you so much for all your questions. Um, it's been really interesting and uh, great to hear what your concerns are. Um, just to flag that uh, in September, there will be two weeks of engagement events, zooming in on some of the really nitty gritty issues of housing or transport or nature and biodiversity or water and flooding and employment and skills and finance and investment, and those kind of things. So if you don't follow us already on Twitter or via our website, uh, please do. We're about to launch a newsletter uh, so please do sign up for that. I'm not sure if you can yet, but um, pretty quickly there will be a, a thing on the website. You can get a newsletter from us to, to enable you to stay up to date. Uh, and then in September, join us at those meetings, feed in. We really want to hear your ideas and to make sure that um, you know, the action plan that we're writing uh, connects with your reality and, and reflects your priorities and concerns. Uh, otherwise, just thank you all very much for posting your questions and participating. Uh, thanks very much to all of our panelists for your, your answers and for giving a bit of your sunny evening to this conversation is crucially important. Uh, but um, yeah, let's uh, finish there and maybe even go and get some sunshine. So thanks again and um, yeah, we'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Thank you.